<laughs> Welcome to the chat. So, Ryan, you take your left hand, yep. flat palm, flat palm. Place your right hand, you touch your thumbs. You sit with your back straight and your head slightly bowed. And then all we're going to do is we're going to try to get to six. Six breaths in and six breaths out without losing attention on the breathing. And you'll see how hard it is. Just gently come out. All that's done is calm their minds. Mm. So all the noise of coming here, all the noise of meeting, just calm down. Yeah, I like it. It's good. <laughs> that was great. It is uh, breath work, and that is something that I do. And it, it, yeah, I even can then, because you weren't suffering that much. From no, doing no, it. no. I mean, staying present is is the tricky part. But mm -hmm. I definitely. Um, yeah, it, but even six breaths. I did lose count, though. <laughs> yeah. I was focusing on it that much. I didn't know how many I did. Well, that's all right. If you manage mm. to focus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so today in the shed, I have someone who is no stranger to living outside of the law and uh, with a life filled with highs and lows. At a very young age, he joined the Merchant Navy. He jumped ship at uh, 17 in New Orleans, yeah. around about that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, hitchhiked across hippie America, which is what I like to go by, hippie. I love that name. <laughs> and um, yeah, that was in the early 70s, only to come back to the UK. Was it around 19? No, 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 no. I was only out, out there for about six months. Six months. That's all you, that's all you, months, all, I got nicked. All you they did. brought me back. They <laughs> bolted me. <laughs> so um, smuggling became a choice, you know, um, and... It became a, a career of, of my guest today and uh, smuggling the white powder that tends to be found on the, all the surfaces in Soho's finest toilets these days. <laughs> and in Parliament. <laughs> yeah, and in Parliament. I actually fucking wrote that and took it out. <laughs> well, but it's true. Yeah, it's true. Um, from five-star hotels to penthouses in Europe, the Caribbean and South Pacific to jungle kitchens in South America and even visits to Africa and Brazil. To being in prison down under and escaping a few others, it sounds like one hell of a roller coaster. And now a practicing Buddhist and author of the book series To Live Outside the Law, with the first book out, uh, of the series out now, Finding My Mojo. Not actually the first book. Not the first book. What was the first book? The first book is called Finding Peace. And oh, it's Finding with Peace. the editor right now. Right, okay. Like everything I started yeah, in the middle yeah. and I'm working my way This out. is the first. You've done a Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> so, yeah. But the first book that is actually physically um, out. The only one that's available. It's avail yeah, yeah. available on Kindle and it's available on Audible. Okay, amazing. So but Another one will be out in September. Oh, hello. <laughs> get to work, get to work. <laughs> no, great. So, Simon McCoy, nice to meet you. Nice. To Welcome to the too, shed. Thank you. <laughs> and thanks for starting it with a meditation. You know, I, I'm I'm usually, my listeners now know, I'm usually the person that gives the meditation first. So it's nice for someone to gift that back in that way. So we're going to go into the woods. <laughs> You're even going to hear the woods. <laughs> So I'm going to keep it a little bit lower as well, just so we don't get lost in the woods. Yeah, if you just want to relax, close your eyes, yeah. and uh, I'll bring this. I'll bring this back a little bit. Yeah, yeah. You good with that? Yeah, that's good. That's good. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to ask you a series of questions while you're in the woods, mm. and just just tell me whatever comes to your mind first, and uh, then at the end we can we can have a little sum up. <laughs> we, can, we, can we can have the man with the white coat come and get you. Yeah. Right? <laughs> He's on call by. Yeah. So, 
You're walking through the woods and the leaves are falling and light's coming through the trees. And as you're walking, you look to the right of you and there's someone there walking with you. Who is this person? My dad. Your dad. And you continue to walk. And then your dad kind of goes off into the distance and you see a little rumbling in the bushes and there's an animal. This animal comes out. What type of animal is it? It's a dog. A dog. And what sort of interaction do you have with this dog? We're going for a walk together <laughs> and out in the bushes looking for a rabbit. <laughs> do you know this dog? Yeah, yeah. 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 And now you're going to walk further and further into the woods and you're going to come to a clearing. And before you, you see your dream house. Could you describe this dream house? Yes, it's a um, barley house. It's built mainly of wood. It has a reed roof. The rooms are open at the top because it's a nice tropical place. Um, yeah, very simple. It has a, a garden, has flowers. Not very big, very open. Very open. And is there a fence? No. No fence. You're going to walk into your dream house now, and there's a dining table. Could you descri describe what you see on the dining table and around it? Mm, well, some magazines. There's a large pepper grinder and salt grinder. I'm looking and I'm not seeing much more. Yeah, there's a couple of places set. Yeah, there's just two places set. Oh, sorry. Don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> they're, they're opposite one another. Yeah. Is there any food, flowers, anything like that? No, no, no. no, no, no. Very simple wooden table. Yeah. yeah very simple. And then you're going to walk out of your house and there's a cup on the floor. Can you tell me what the cup's made of? It's a um, ceramic mug. It's a white ceramic mug. And what do you do with the cup? I pick it up and put it on the side. It shouldn't be on the floor. Yeah, you look after it. <laughs> <laughs> so now you're going to walk to the end of the property and there's, at the edge, there's a body of water. What type of body of water is this? Oh, it's the Caribbean. <laughs> in the woods. Yeah, well, yeah, but it's the woods on the edge of the Caribbean. <laughs> I love it, I love it. All right, so it's, it's a big fucking ocean, basically. It's, no, it's a beautiful sandy beach. Yeah. And coral. There are dark patches and light patches. And there's coral, and there's an entrance, and there's sandy bit, parts of the beach. It's home. It's where I love to live. And how do you cross it? I don't need to cross it. I can't cross it. It's an ocean. You know, it's the Caribbean. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but I walk along it. Yeah. I walk along the beach. There are, there are palm trees and little sand dunes and there are other houses as I walk along. Yeah. Amazing. Well you have come to the end of your journey. <laughs> okay. So it's a psychological test, but I hate the word test. Yeah. I think it's a psychological understanding. Or investigation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the person that you're walking with is the most important person to you right now. So you said your dad. Weird. Yeah, he's been dead for ages. Mm -hmm. He was what popped up. Sorry. Yeah, no, yeah. there's no sorry. There's no Just wrong or right tell answer. My girlfriend. <laughs> Get in trouble. <laughs> Why don't I come up? <laughs> yeah. Um, the size of the animal is representative of your perception of your size of your problems. So a dog that you knew, you know what I mean? You're pretty friendly with your problems. <laughs> well, I'm so used to them by now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, the severity of the interaction with the animal is how you deal with your problems. So you went with a walk. You went, you went, you went for a walk with your problems, basically. So you're not really in fear of any fucking problems, are you? <laughs> Man's of best friend, <laughs> literally. Yeah, no, it was yeah. my dog. Really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I haven't Charlie. had that. I mean, I've had Charlie. Charlie. I've had, um, you know, some people say a bear. 
or Ooh. or a parrot or a wolf. But then their interaction, like the bear, my mate Victor said it, and he, he's a big lad, and he just said, oh, I said, what what sort of interaction do you have with the bear? He's like, we kind of like fist bumped and hugged, <laughs> you know? So <laughs> cool. the size of the problems is also mm-hmm. how you interact with them as well, you know? Um, your dream house uh, is representative of your ambition to solve the problems. So, I mean, you went into exactly everything about it from the outside really so and it's not too big not too small you know it fits fits in the the woods of the caribbean i'd say yeah Yeah. the fence indicates an open personality so you know no fence indicates an open personality but some people have a tiny little opening or you know slightly guarded i'll let a few people in but not too many um i have the luxury of not having to do that anymore yeah i lived most of my life like a dartboard yeah yeah, there was one big circle of people yeah. that didn't know me at all but knew of me, saw me. Mm. Another circle that saw a bit more and then there was the tiny bullseye. They were the people that knew who I was Mm-mm. and who I was open with. Yeah. It's a hard way to live. I like living differently. Yeah, well, they say uh, keep your friends close, keep your enemies close. Closer. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. keep them on the bullseye, basically. <laughs> no, my friends were in the bullseye. Yeah, my yeah, enemies yeah. were out on that, on that second ring. Yeah, yeah. The ring that goes around the other side. Yeah, Not yeah. a darts player, but I know. We'll... Triples, yeah. really. Triples, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, triples, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's what it is. Yeah. I like that. Uh, food or people or flowers on the dining table. Um you didn't say any of them, so it means you're generally unhappy. You're generally unhappy? You seem pretty happy to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, nothing's perfect, is it? No, exactly. There are a couple of magazines. What does he say about those magazines? Yeah, that's, that's what it says. It doesn't say about the magazines. Well, there you go. Yeah. Maybe I mean, the magazines be. is you've probably eaten. <laughs> <laughs> and now you want to read something. They were cooking magazines. There you go. There you go. So you're going to make for... <laughs> Uh, the durability of the material of the cup is representative of the the duality of the relationship with you and the person in number one, which was your dad. Mm-hmm. So you said China, didn't you? You said uh, yeah, ceramic. Ceramic. Mm-hmm. Ceramic. Yeah. yeah. So that's pretty solid, really. You know what I mean? Your position, um, no, the the size the size of the body of water is representative of your desire for love. <laughs> <laughs> Oceans. Ocean. Yes, we've got that right. Yes. So, so yeah, that's that's something that I um, yeah. I like to start with. It's great that we could, but we could both do that without knowing beforehand either. Yeah, really. yeah. Listen, yeah. No, it's ruined if you start thinking. Well, what am I supposed to say? Yeah, yeah. Of course. Well, that's what I mean. It's it. Both what we did, focus on the breath and focus on on what visualization comes. I think it works very well to keep you in the present. Yeah. And so many people just say, oh, yeah. Why did I say a parrot? <laughs> <laughs> Gave it a high five. So we've we've given the listeners a little bit of a introduction about your life, which seems, you know, one hell of a life to have. But let's to try and break it down or or, or not break it down in a sense, where where should we start best with you? Uh, what was your earliest memory? Basically, of? I was a good kid. I'm going to move this a little bit closer. Yeah, okay. Well, you're comfortable. Nice. I was a good kid, went to school, did well, got me 11 plus. (laughs) Yeah. And then I got sent to boarding school. And I hated it. From the minute I arrived, I hated it. Because you never go home. Mm. So you're constantly in jail. It was like being in jail. And I came out of that. After a year, when they said, would you like to leave? I went, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm out of here. Um, and I went to grammar school. And um, by the time I was 13, I decided I didn't want to play that anymore. I was bored with that. And I worked out very cleverly, fool that I was, that it was a lot easier to do an hour and a half detention once a week than do an hour's homework every night. So I didn't do any homework. Um, and I've got... Just done out. the extra hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know how to write. You must keep to the right side at all times. I wrote it out an awful lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, but when I was 15, um, I got kicked out of school because uh, 
one of the girls at school had been telling her mates in the music room that Rocky, which was my nickname at the time, was going to get a spit of hash for the weekend. And one of her mates went and told her mum. <laughs> oh, fuck. And it took the school about three weeks to find out how Rocky was, and then I was asked if I'd like to leave. Mm. And I was, again, deeply disappointed to say, yeah, bye-bye. I left school. So, why am I doing a paid partnership with BetterHelp? Well, I'll tell you why. Because over the course of three months, I've had therapy. And I was assigned with the most amazing therapist who's taught me how to reconnect with those individual parts that have been neglected over the years. I've had addictions, I've struggled to be sober, but nothing could have been as easy as signing up to better help. It starts with a simple questionnaire and then you're matched with a personalised therapist. You can schedule in your sessions and you can even direct message anytime. You can meet your therapist and you can even write in your journal and have group sessions. How amazing is that? Just as amazing as this ancient pool. So if you're ready to dip into something that might be uncomfortable, sign up to better help because it'll be worth it. I did my first smuggle. I did my first, first smuggle, smuggle when I was 14. Yeah. For the very first time, we went abroad on holiday. Yeah, I come from an ordinary working class family. Um, it was a big thing to go abroad. We went to abroad. I fell in love. Fell in love with a Dutch girl. And uh, her name was Lily. Yeah. And it was just at the time of the songs of Pictures of Lily. Yeah. Made he feels so good. Anyway, so I fell in love with Lily and I wanted a flick knife because that was cool. So I bought a flick knife, which was illegal to bring back into the UK. Mm -hmm. And I smuggled it in. And they both gave me an erection. <laughs> yeah, Lily. They both and, did. <laughs> and smuggling a flick knife. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Didn't do it again for ooh, 24 years. 15 years, 15 years, something like that, 14 years. Mm. Didn't do it again, but I enjoyed smuggling. There you go. Mm. So you want more of my life from there on in? So so that gave you a bit of a taste, but then you obviously drifted from that, from that, uh, from Lily and the flick knife, or did you keep the flick knife and lose Lily? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I lost Don't Lily. Think, Lily, yeah. Lily was a, a love loss. She was that. She went back to Holland. <laughs> um... But right, so where did I go from there? Well, okay. I mean, so you know, would would the navy be a, a, a jump? Was that was that far beyond that? You know, okay. you kind of touch base on oh, the yeah, navy, no. and then actually, I've told you a terrible lie. Yeah, <laughs> I joined the merchant navy yeah. and flew out to Durban, which I was really thrilled about because I'd always wanted to go to Australia, mm. which was a bit of a disappointment because Durban's in South Africa. <laughs> I was trying to think what the fuck that was there. I didn't um, do well in school either. Geography was a bit of a myth. Oh, well, pretty good on geography. I've done a lot of it. Um, so anyway, I turned up there <clears throat> and I went on the ship and obviously I was dead anti-apartheid. Mm. Yeah. So the first thing they did is they gave me a boy, <coughs> which is a grown man. I'm 16 years of age. And I've got a grown man to do everything for me. Mm. And he keeps calling me sir. And it's doing my <coughs> head in. So first thing I said to him is, can you get me some weed? <laughs> <laughs> which he did. Yeah. He brought me Durban poison, which in those days came in long, thin sticks. Mm. And were hallucinogenic. Oh, okay. They were really good. Was that, is that a cannabis then? What is yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh. It's the type of weed. Mm -hmm. uh, you can still get it. DP, Durban Poison. So, anyway, we go down to the pub together and get thrown out because black and white people aren't allowed in the same pub. This mm. is South Africa. And then he took me to a bar called Mumbles, little club, where all the long hairs hang out. So there's me, 16 years of age. I know it all, of course, because you do. 
I'm sitting there and they've got bikes and I'm sort of cool bike man. I'm like, fuck all about bikes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, good weed you got here, man. And one girl turns to the other and says, do you think they gave him poison? Mm -hmm. And I shit myself. I thought, the oh, fuckers, they poison it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, long story short, I go around the, around the block in the boat, pick up a shoe, not a shoe box, but what I did is I bought a load of weed in Mozambique and I shoved it in the uh, cigarette packets. And then resealed the cig cigarette packets and walked through with that. And then gave it all out to my mates at school. <laughs> <laughs> so that was another smuggle. But I didn't do another smuggle. Yeah, I was yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I left the Merchant Navy. I got chucked out of the Merchant Navy for jumping ship. Okay. I'll, I'll, let's go into that story a little bit. <laughs> uh, well, I was led astray by a girl called. <laughs> so I think this is going to be a running story. <laughs> yeah. a bit. Is this one called Daisy? <laughs> <laughs> no, she was called Sugar. She's a sweet little name. Uh, and we've all done that acid together. Um, and little tiny window panes they were. Mm. And um, I met up with, Day with Sugar. She changed her name. And um, yeah. went back to her place and stayed a day. Had to go back to the ship. Didn't go back to the ship. I was with a few other people and they went, do you want to come with us? Yeah, come with us. Um, we worked for a guy called Tony Marcello. And I think you could sell weed for us. And I went, yeah, of course. <laughs> so we got taken to Memphis. I went to Memphis. Yeah. In the meantime, my parents are on holiday in Austria. Mm. So they got no idea I disappeared. And I they know, still think you're in the Navy then? Yeah, they yeah, still yeah, think yeah. I'm in the Navy. They're really cool. Um, and I know they're coming back on the 15th. And I'll make sure I call them on the 15th. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we got to Memphis and it wasn't going well. I didn't like these people. <laughs> they weren't my people. So I walked out. And I started hitching. And I stopped hitching when I reached Santa Barbara. How long was that? That was a month, something like that. It didn't take ages. And everywhere I went, people were brilliant. Mm. It was a really lovely time, yeah? It was a really lovely time. People give you lifts. Say, we've got somewhere to stay now. Oh, we got a crash pad. Come stay with us. Yeah, so you just sofa surfing. Yeah, and just really. Four wheel gliding. I started <laughs> off with about $12 in my pocket. And when I got nicked, I had 25 and a half an ounce of weed that I just chucked out. Mm -hmm. And the cops pulled up. Um, and you didn't see it? No. No. No, but what they did say, I've been pulled a couple of times and I said, yeah, I'm Canadian, I'm going home, I lost my passport in Memphis and the cops said it's all right if I go back to to Canada, just make my way home. Mm -hmm. And a couple of them have gone for it. Yeah. But this guy went, yeah, come on, Simon, come and sit in the, come and sit in the cab a minute and we'll just check that out. Mm. And then they took me to jail. Mm. And I walk into jail and the guy goes, all right, date of birth. So I give him my date of birth and he looks at me and he goes, you can't come here. You're a minor. Yeah. So they took me to juvenile hall. God. Which was brilliant. <laughs> it was great. I was on holiday. I was having a whale of a time. So I walk into juvenile hall. The nurse interviews me and she says to me, right, okay, are you allergic to any drugs? And I got a bit off acid. And she said, really? I've got a friend who's like that too. It was just that cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they used to take me every day to immigration hall where there's a big pen full of Mexicans and me. Mm. And the secretaries used to pull me out to listen to my cute British accent. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a great time. End of the, end of the story, they're going to deport me. Meantime, ah, I forgot something. I'm sorry. It's a long life, huh? Um, where did they begin? We, <laughs> I'm in Las Vegas. Yeah. It's the 15th of the month. Yeah. When you meant to call your parents. Well, I got to call my parents. Yeah. Reverse charges. So I bet you was in a great state in the Las Vegas. <laughs> of course. Wearing the so, same shirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We didn't have a lot of change of clothes. <laughs> no, this is true. Um, so I phone up 
And then you've got a reverse charge call coming from Las Vegas. And I go, hello, Dad, it's Stephen. And he says, of course it's fucking Stephen. Where you been? <laughs> They'd been home two days. When they got home, there was a pile they knew. that high yeah. from the, the shipping company saying, your son is missing. Mm -hmm. Your son is missing, presumed dead. Yeah, they'd had a terrible time. Mm -hmm. So anyway... Get so anyway. Yeah, so <laughs> get chucked on the plane. He gave me. I love my dad. Yeah. Um, got on the plane, arrived at Heathrow. And you know in life there are things you really regret that you've done wrong, that you should never have done. Well, I did one of them then. Because as I get off this plane, this ponce from the British government comes and picks me up and says, right, follow me. As we're on the walking walkway, he said to me, I do hope you didn't get deported for anything nasty. And I went, nah, just jumping chip. And I still regret that, because I could have said murdering a policeman, mm. which would have been much more fun. <laughs> so <laughs> I go home. Um, then I decide that the sensible thing is to go to college, get a year at college. What did you study there? Uh, O-levels. A levels, yeah. O levels. O levels. O levels. Yeah, yeah. I got three. I didn't go to college much, but there was some good weed about. <laughs> and um, seemed like you liked a lot of weed at this weed and acid at this stage in a lot. Yeah, not so much acid. I'm always a little bit leery of that acid personally. Mm. It's a very serious matter. Mm. I know a lot of people treat it as a party drug, but it's not. No, it's definitely it not. It has to be. It's a very for strong, me, it's, concentrated. Yeah, it's a religious experience for mm. me. Always has been. Can uh, go on a fucking while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you about that. <laughs> um, so then I did college. I went and got a job as a salesman. Did very well at it. I'd met my first wife, Helen. Uh, we'd met, she was my boss while I was earning money in college. I worked as a waiter because mm. uh, I'd done catering on the boat. So I knew about silver service and shit like that. Um, and we got on and I got a job. I got a mortgage. I got my first house at 19. How much it, was it? It was £3,750. <laughs> and I saved up the deposit. Over six months working. Yeah. We didn't know we were born in those days. Like, it is so fucking hard these days for young people to get Ain't got property. a fucking chance. Man. No. I'm moving into a thing that's got wheels for that reason. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's gone impossible. Mm. And it's wrong. People yeah. should have a home. Yeah. My, my dad's first house was five grand. Yeah. You know, and that, I, I think he was married... He was married real young, uh, 1920s, and he had a house. Marriage, yeah. then kid on the way as well. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, and that's how it was. I've got to wait till 40 to do that one. Yeah. Saving up Not for only my that, 20. But when you get to 40, <laughs> you're going to get yourself a 35-year bloody mortgage. Yeah, no. Nah. Mine was 25. Yeah. It's all right, I lost the house and everything, so mm. it doesn't really matter. But easy start. Um, and then I lost my job. I was found myself working for a German con man. I was in publishing. I sold advertising. Mm. And a friend of mine said, look, this guy's got a really good job. He'd be really good as his ad manager. And he was a con man. I didn't know it at the time, obviously, because I took the job. He was a good one at the start then. Yeah. <laughs> and he had offices in Knightsbridge and I got paid double what I was earning before and I got put in charge of everything and I'm still, what, 20? Yeah. Um, and then I found out that he owned a bank. He owned a bank. Mm. And he used to write letters <clears> of <throat> credit on this bank and then not pay them because he owned the bank. So one day I had to invite everybody that we owed money to a party because he was going to come over and pay them. And he didn't. So I smacked somebody. I was a little upset. So I smacked somebody and quit. Then I went on the markets. Started selling stuff on the markets. Like that, bananas or? No, I started selling. My dad worked as a, an agent. He used to work for manufacturers. Mm. And a couple of them made games. And he had a load of samples. So I flogged them, flogged yeah, some yeah. more, then started buying them. And I specialised in selling games, adult games, like backgammon, chess, 
yeah, arts, yeah. whatever. Yeah. How old you? How old was you? I'm then? now 21, 21, 22, yeah, yeah, yeah. 21, yeah. 22. And going from a job that had lots of status and a company car and expense accounts, suddenly I'm out getting up six o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, putting on two pairs of long johns and going out standing in the fucking cold. Yeah. But making money. <laughs> I was making money. <laughs> and um, I used to work seven days a week. We built it up. I got a shop, got another shop, did something else. We did really well. Um, over eight years, I built up a manufacturing, printing, retailing business, all in the same field. Mm -hmm. And then the pound went to $2.25. And suddenly, everything that I made, the Chinese could make in a second. for less than I could buy the raw materials. Mm. Went broke over six months. Lost everything. Was this the recession as well then? Yeah, it was in, oh, God, I've got, I think, 28. So mm. <sighs> a lot of that was to do with uh, with drugs as well going over to China as well, wasn't it? Wasn't it the, the president then decided rather than do anything to do with drugs, he was going to turn it into the manufacturer of the world? I can't remember what it was called. And he even had, it was like, the claw i can't remember what this fucking thing was this uh documentary i watched by um his name's adam something and he said that time period the reason why they turned it into that manufacturing because was america was shipping heroin over to china and ruining it in that way so that, really yeah it was something like that and yeah, no, i honestly don't know anything mm. about that i hadn't had a joint by then for about five years. Yeah, yeah. I'd gone straight E one eighty. Mm. No, you're getting your dopamine hit out of work then. Yeah, and mm. making money and yeah, just living. Didn't ever have any money for me. Always had money for the business. Oh no, how yeah. that feels. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you, you I just keep building it up. <laughs> yeah. Well the trouble is I always do that and I keep building it up and keep building it up and it yeah. keeps falling over. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyway. I know that feeling too. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, we've got things in common. I already know that. <laughs> um, so anyway, I lost everything. Lost my house. My missus is crying because we've got bailiffs coming round. Mm. And I thought, oh, well, how the fuck am I going to make some money? I went and saw a mate. I said, look, I want to go to South Africa. I want to pick up some DP, Durban Poison. I need so much money. Go and get it. He went, yeah, all right. I'll lend you that. I flew out to South Africa. I had another mate who knew someone in Durban who could get. We ended up driving out with the, this um, African guy right out to the middle of Trans Sky, which is where Nelson Mandela comes from, and is where the weed is grown. Dacha, they call it. Mm. And I'm sat in a village with a pile of pound notes, fivers. And these African witch, men, witch doctors coming up with aluminium washing bowls full of weed. And going, there you go, that's a fiver. <laughs> right, next one, next one. <laughs> Filled the suitcase to the brim, yeah. Pressed it into little blocks. Took the, took the, crawl, the seeds out of it first. Mm -hmm. There's no point in transporting seeds, is there? Pressed it, shoved it in this suitcase, cut one of those foam mattresses in half, wrapped it around the whole thing and sprayed aftershave all over it. <laughs> Walked up to the airport in Durban, shoved it on there, didn't see it again till it came back into Europe. Mm. When it arrived in Europe, I'd been shopping in Duty Free and I bought some uh, necklaces out of ivory. And these big signs all over, mustn't bring ivory, ivory's illegal. And I'm thinking, well, fuck me, that's not right because it's... I bought it in duty free. But anyway, but anyway, this seems like a good idea. So I stroll straight up to the man in the box and I go, excuse me, and I pull out these two X's and I say, I bought these, but I bought these in, in the airport. So this isn't illegal, is it? And he goes, oh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to confiscate that. <laughs> really? Oh, but that's unfair. That's for my mum and my mum-in-law. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, the guy gives me the form. And he says, look, you send that in 
and you might kill it back. And I go, oh, thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs> and walk through customs mm. with a suitcase full of Yeah, wings. deflection. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that was the start of it, mm. really. And so it, through sort of, you know, how, how old was you then? Because it was 21 and then 20, you built that business. 28. 28. 28. Yeah, yeah. 28, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, I, I, I had a business, a clothing line business. It was doing quite well and everything else. And then, and then COVID hit and wiped that all out. Mm. And then I was like, "Fuck! What am I gonna fucking do now?" I didn't go and get what you did because I couldn't fly anywhere because I was stuck here. Yeah. But you know that that through that you know you can either look at like, "Fucking hell! I can't move on and do nothing else." But that's how I started this really because because I couldn't do festivals or anything like that anymore. But you get used to that lifestyle. It was having the, them things. Yeah, I, I didn't have that many things, but I had my independence. The passion, though. And I was pissed off. Mm. I was pissed off because I have to moan up to, to one of my sins. I thought Maggie Thatcher was right. Yeah. When she came out, I thought she was right. And I did everything she said. I got up off my ass and I worked my little ass together and I employed people. And I love employing people. Well, mm. I loved. I'm not spun now. But... <laughs> I loved employing people because I felt I was helping, yeah? And then they just switched the game on me mm. and took everything from me. And I thought, well, fuck you then. Yeah, if that's how the system runs, because they were very happy to just close me down. There was no conversation about, well, no you know. No support, no, yeah. What can we do to help? It was like, oh, no, sorry, can't pay bills, bugger off, mm -hmm. Um and that's that was my little. It's not bit much of different now. <laughs> it's never been any different. No. Um, Recessions come every ten years, you know. They, yeah, they come. and they always wipe out the little bloke that's been struggling because mm. the big guys never go down. No. Yeah, they're talking now about all this interest rates for the banks. Yeah, and now they they're charging everybody the big interest rate, but they're failing to pay it out to their lenders, mm. their their investors. And we bailed them out a few years ago. Mm. Yeah. Also, you go into a bank now. You, I went into a bank with my dad a little while ago, right? We was in there five and a half fucking hours. Fuck. From what nine did you in get the morning. Doing? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck all. But literally, we he bought some classic cars, right? Mm -hmm. So only two. Is that what's out there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll yeah. show you before you oh, leave. Cool. Um, but literally, they. So he's old school, right? He's not he's not a phone laptop guy, he's just about a laptop guy, right? Does most of his transfers on a laptop. Didn't bring his laptop to where we was and we was about three hours away. We got to drive these cars back as well. And they're not the best fucking runners, right? <laughs> One broke down. Oh, and I'll tell you that. Spare parts for normal, they're <laughs> Literally. So what happened was we went to the banks, I said, Oh, how much can you transfer on a machine? We need to we need to basically either take cash out or make a transfer to this company, which we bought at an auction, right? Oh, I don't know how much the machines do. I've never used them like that. And then I've seen on the, on a little badge, it says trainee. I'm like, great. <laughs> so then I said, all right, so how much can you transfer if you did a phone, phone call? Because he usually does it on his laptop and he hasn't got that with him. Oh, I don't know. I don't use... Uh, phone call banking and I'm like who the fuck are you excuse me <laughs> is, is anyone else here <laughs> yeah. so so then uh, after realising she wasn't going to do absolutely fucking anything I said look we'll leave so I downloaded the app on my phone right to transfer money from my dad so I said just log into that I'll do it instantly flags it up so then they call they call my dad's phone and say you know there's fraud investigation we want to know who's, who's typing and oh my son's trying to help me here so she says you need to go back into the bank with your id then ring us from the bank phone and prove who you are right <laughs> this is fucking nuts right this is your money we're talking this about, is yeah. your money people your money <laughs> yeah. literally so we then go into the bank and guess who's there my best friend that knows nothing about banking big up the trainee <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. so, then, so then she goes okay but she didn't understand that I needed to use the phone to explain to the fraud department. So she so started like ringing. The, the number, she yeah. started ringing the normal number and then didn't really get it. So then we get in a put put in a room. We're in this room forever. It seemed like forever. I could I can feel the energy in the room, right? I can feel the tension 
uh, and it was just building. And my dad is like a stroppy git at this point. <laughs> and and the, the manager comes in and she's like, oh, um, she, you have to explain the whole story over again, you know. And then she was like, oh, okay, so do, do you want do you want to go to this place and chat no my dad's like no i want you to transfer it now and then it's like boom silence and i'm like great what's going on eventually get to the point where she's got a ring again the fraud investigation department has now believed it but they said you need to ring back in 10 minutes to do something else right we, just to let everyone know we've been in the bank this is probably around 12 o'clock in the afternoon i've been there since nine o'clock in the morning right are we going to give a shout out to this bank? <laughs> HS fucking BC. HS, oh, Hong Kong, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, they built their money on, on yeah, no, smuggling. No, fuck, it was, heroin, it was Halifax. Yeah. It was Halifax, actually. Mm. Yeah, but HSBC, that's another one. They, they 800,000 smuggling Mexican. It was it was that, right, you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. HSBC mm. was built in Hong Kong yeah. from the heroin money, yeah. the opium money from the opium wars. Mm -mm. Have you read um, Taipan? No. Should do. Oh, it's an old no. book, but it's a brilliant book about yeah, yeah, yeah. Hong Kong smuggling heroin yeah. or, or opium thing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, HSBC comes from that. Yeah, because they got caught a little while ago. It was like 800,000. Washing well. money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so we're, in, we're in Halifax, and eventually this fucking uh, woman calls, calls the thing, uh, call, calls the um, fraud investigation department, a man comes onto that line. It's a no, new person now. We've called too early within this 10 minutes, so you have to go through the whole process again. And they love to keep you holding because so, you're, you're such a valuable... We value yeah. your custom so much, we're going to keep you waiting for So she, she looks so. at me and says, I need to ask you a question. I said, okay. I already know what's going on. They think that my dad isn't compass mentos, oh. and they think that I'm windling money from him, right? <laughs> To buy these two classic cars, which they have invoices in front of them with his name on it, and he's clearly standing there knowing his name, who he is, and what he's doing, right? So then I have to leave the room. But my dad, under stress, gets quite frustrated. Mm -hmm. And with technology, he has no fucking patience for it. So then he has to change passwords and everything else. And I'm not in the room, and that's where I just wanted to help him do that, right? So then he comes out, but I'm outside for like another hour. <sighs> It was so mad. But I said, what? Out? I, I said, they won't even answer the questions. I said, what if he just wanted to take that money out, cash? Now, oh, you'd have to order it. How long would that take? Well, our business area isn't open today, but usually about a week. I was like, so we're talking like eight grand. We are not talking a hundred grand over here. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's nuts. We ain't handing out any money. It's ours. We're looking old. <laughs> I love, I love, so I don't I, like banks. <laughs> I, love, I love the way that when you when you call them, right? First of all, they are experiencing unusually heavy load of of uh, calls right now, mm. and that's been for the last five fucking years. Like, what's going on mm. there? They're not experiencing unusual. They just don't want too many people answering those phones because they cost money. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be AI soon. I mean, you go into all these banks now and it's, it's maybe one or two staff. Most of it's machinery. Most of it's going to be yeah. AI. So then you're going to have no control over uh, a computer says no. computer says no. No one's <laughs> in it. No one's there to help you. I use Revolut. I yeah. I find them quite good. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty hip of you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. Yeah. So we've gone from 28 and, uh, you know, you was, you, you've gone into the world of, of smuggling now. So this is your new path. You've you've left the recession. Only doing it for a year. Only doing it for a year. Only well. going to do it for a year, get enough money to start my business. Was again. that the headspace then or was that what happened? No, that was the headspace. <laughs> I've only smuggled for a year for four decades, basically. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. Every time I go back to work, it's like, we'll just do it for a year. Mm. And then what happens is it starts working well. And then when it starts working well, well, it's fucking taken two years to get it working. I'm not going to stop now. Yeah, you're getting taste. Yeah, mm. that's what happens. But, uh, yeah, so where did we go from there? Well, well you took you took this DP. Was that what it was called? Yeah, we bought, bought that, uh, that weed in. Uh, so back then, going through an airport, you know, you didn't have the, the body scans. You didn't have, you just, you just did, pulled out some fucking ivory and went straight through that. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah. yeah, the stuff sat in, sat in Rome for about four hours because I had a connection. I went out shopping in Rome. Mm. I was sat in there and I'm thinking, when I come back, 
when I come back, I hope they're not waiting for me. <laughs> no, it's just ball sticks. How do you deal with nerves like that? Um, you know... At that stage as it's, well. It, it's difficult to explain, but I don't get nervous. I think it's 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 a little little line that you're stood on, which is between acceptance and fear. All right, I'm busted. Yeah, it's going to go wrong. All right. Mm. So I don't worry about it anymore. Can't change it. Accept it instantly. Yeah, can't change it. That's it. That's it. And... I always say, in those days, it was kamikaze stuff. It was, shove it in a suitcase, move it. That's not clever. Yeah, in finding my mojo, I explain the system that I put together that worked for decades mm. um, and was intelligent. What I was working on at the beginning was balls and desperation. And then was that you generally walking through, shifting it that way? like? And then... Yeah, I started off doing it all on my own and then... As things start working, you can only do them so many trips, Ryan. You know, like, mm. oh, where's more, more, Mr. And more. McCoy? This is your seventh visit this year. <laughs> yeah, they begin to wonder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, you get other people involved, and other people do it. But once I got my system together, I always used to tell everybody the same thing: if you don't tell them, they won't know. It's as simple as that. And I've had customs men pick up cases, cases of kit, and help me move it out of the car so they can look underneath and have a look at my, uh, have a look at my spare wheel to make sure I haven't been tampering with it. Mm. Yeah, And help me put it back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so if you don't tell them, they don't know. Mm. Yeah. So back in the day then, would they not think it would be on your person or in your, your suitcase in that sense? They were always looking... You know, so were you driving a lot of the time as well? No, well, I used to bring it into Europe. Yeah. And then I would move it around Europe. Mm. So I would often drive it from one place to the next. What was your car of choice? <laughs> My car of choice was always a very... Shit. shit <laughs> common, boring car. Mm -mm. Yeah. You don't want to drive around in a big Beamer. Yeah. No, of course. There was a, there's a lovely story, if you've got time. There's a we lovely, got a time, yeah, don't yeah, worry. <laughs> there's a lovely story. Um, we'd moved some kit into Europe, uh, and one of the couriers had had a bit of a problem and arrived in France, uh, and he was supposed to be arriving in Holland, and it had been raining the day he had to catch the plane. So they said, all right, well, you can't, the plane's not going. We got there late because it had been really, really raining. We got there late. I so, said, right, okay, well, that's all right. Come back tomorrow. But your flight now will be into Charles de Gaulle, and then you have to change change airports to fly to the dam. Mm. Uh, you don't want to do that. Uh, yeah. Well, you're not going to... He sat... While they're telling us, he sat with what he had, because he had a jacket, puffy jacket, mm. and we'd sewn the kit. This was before I, I found my mojo. We'd sewn the kit in little packets in the puffy jacket and put it in the suitcase. Don't wear it, put it in the suitcase. When you get to the airport in Amsterdam, open up the suitcase in front of everybody and put the jacket on. Mm. They won't touch your jacket. They'll go in your case, maybe, but they won't touch your jacket. It won't occur to them because they're not that bright. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, he's arrived in Paris. <laughs> he gets off the plane. They pull him off the plane. He, he, he's walking through the, through to get to immigration. They pull him, they search him, they go through him. They can't find anything, they let him go. He gets into the the um, baggage hall, pulls his case out, that's what he's told, puts his jacket on, walks on through, is outside waiting for a cab when they come and get him again. And they pull him back in and they search his bag. Don't touch his jacket. Mm. So he isn't catching that plane to Amsterdam, man. I get a phone call. We've had something else arrive in Amsterdam. So I'm up in Amsterdam dealing with that. And I get this call. Eamon won't leave Paris. He says he's not going anywhere till he sees you. All right. So I drive down. Tell him away today, I'll see him. Drive down. He's got the jacket, right? He's staying in this little, dumpy little hotel dive. And um, 
I oh, can't say, all right, Evan, how are you? Boom, 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 boom. Okay, come on, let's go and have a drink. And I'll send you home on the train. I'll sort this out, don't worry. So he puts the jacket on. And I go, fuck off. Take the jacket off. No, no, I'm not letting go of this jacket. He won't let go of the fucking jacket. Like, it's a million to one chance, but you've only got to be in a bar. There's a fight and the cops turn up. Mm. Yeah, It's just ridiculous to be walking around with three keys and a kit in your, on your jacket when you don't need to. So anyway, he goes, I put it in the Allegro. It was an Allegro at this time, not white Allegro. I put it in the back of the Allegro. In a briefcase. Just chopped it out the, uh, the the jacket, put it in a briefcase, chop it out of the seat. Yeah, yeah. Park it at Calais, at the docks. Safest place on the planet. Nobody's going to rob your car. There's cameras everywhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice and safe. Yeah. So... I come back a few days later, pick up the car. This is before the EU. This is when it's Benny Lux. And between Holland, Belgium, Luxembourg, there are no borders. But there's still the French border. Mm. But the French border's very relaxed. Very, very. I know this little back route. There's a, there's a little hut there, but nobody's ever there. I'm cool, got it under the seat. I'm waiting until a boat unloads from the UK. I've got UK plates. I join them. We're all going on our way. I'm going up to Amsterdam. I'm not I'm going to ride them, but anyway. So I turn up, and as I turn up at the frontier, this guy comes out, the little box runs down, puts the barrier in front of me. Oh, fuck. Oh, no, this is not good. I'm dressed in a pair of slacks, nice, um, what are they called? Uh, oh, blazer. Yeah. White shirt, little <coughs> tie open, a bit wild. Yeah, just a bit wild. It's open. So I'll pull up, and the first thing I do is turn the car off. Open the door, I'm going to go around the back and show him everything in the back of the car. And he says, no, 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 no. No, I do not wish to see search. I do not wish the search. And I'm thinking, oh, good. He said, can you help me? Like, yeah, <laughs> sure, sure. What can I do? I'm Tom Cordell. What can I do? Yeah. He said, well, I have so two people. They have done nothing. They have done nothing. Are you going to Amsterdam? And I go, yeah. Yeah, if you just said you're going to Sweden, I'd have gone, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he says, can you give them a lift? Of course. Yeah. These two guys are down the stairs and in the back of my car before you can say jack shit. <laughs> 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 and we're driving off, yeah. Oh, fuck. So I'm driving along. And, of course, these two are a bit nervous of me because I look straight at 180. <laughs> and I said to the guy who sat, the girl sat in the back, I said, so um, what happened to you then? Well, it was a bus driver. He fucking threw us off the bus. He told them we were doing coke. <laughs> we were dabbing at a bit of vitamin C because we had colds. And he told them it was drugs. I went, oh, terrible, fucking awful. Do you do drugs? <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> he says to me, well... <laughs> he said, oh, really? He said, yeah. he said, yeah, we do a bit of coke, but you can never get anything decent in England. You know, and we haven't got a lot of money. So, we, you know, we can buy half now and again. So, right, we drive through Belgium, cross the Dutch border, and as we cross the Dutch border, even though there are no frontiers, I wasn't having a second crack at it, yeah? I pull into a lay-by and I said to the girl, can you do me a favour, love? There's a briefcase under my, under my seat. Could you pull it out? And she pulls it out. And I said, possible. And I open it up and it's like full of packets of coke. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I haven't got any personal, but we can have a line out of this. <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny. It's such an irresponsible, unprofessional thing to do. It was so <laughs> damn funny. <laughs> <laughs> and I drove them into Amsterdam and I got a little packet and I gave them about half an ounce and I went, here, mm -hmm. it's a little present for you because you were lucky for me. 
And they go, can we have your number? Nobody's going to believe her. <laughs> we need so proof. if they're listening to this, how are you doing, guys? <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, they definitely jumped in a, a crazy car there. Then. <laughs> yeah, it was funny. It was funny. So anyway, so I was moving it here, there, and everywhere. Um, got, when did you jump from, from the cannabis to cocaine? Um, that was my mate who financed me in the beginning. Everybody started saying to me, like, this is like, this is crazy. Mm. Yeah. A kilo of coke is worth a suitcase of weed. You've got to go to coke. And I went, no, hard truck. I don't do hard drugs. Like, no, I think hard drugs are bad. No, I don't do that. And I said to my mate, Dickie Hat, he was called, because he's going, no, nah, it's not like that at all. No, nah, it's not, it's not, it's not. And well, get me some. And in those days, it was so hard to get Coke that I ended up doing liquid Coke, liquid pharmaceutical Coke that a nurse had got us. So I did it down in Brick Lane. Mm. That was the first time I tried Coke. And I don't know if you've done Coke, and I don't know whether you want to admit on this that you yeah, do. Yeah, I've done Coke. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember the first time? Any guy that's gone, oh, fucking hell, do I remember the first time? I was hesitant for a while. I mean, I smoked my first cigarette when I was like 12. Yeah, I tried so. weed before that. I tried weed when I was about 13, 14. And then Coke. We, the thing is, we were going to this pub called the Winchmore Arms around here. And the guy had cancer who owned it. And he was on death's door. So he didn't give a fuck who was in there, what age they was or anything. And the manager at the time as well was doing so much cocaine that he was having heart palpitations. Yeah. <laughs> so I was, recreational use. Yeah, yeah. I was about sixteen going into this pub and we used to we used to fuck around in there. I remember once all our teachers were in there. <laughs> it was like what the fuck is going on? Yeah. So I think it was around that time. Um Can I ask you the question? Yeah, yeah. Is your it. first line of coke? Yeah. What happened? Probably didn't feel that great, I don't think. I was probably pretty drunk as well. Yeah, nothing. No. Nothing. It don't do fuck all. It just it makes does, you catch not, shit and sober yeah. you up. But your first couple of lines, it took me about six months to actually get into coke. Mm. Yeah, it's not an aggressive drug. You can abuse it, totally can abuse it. But, you know, we're all grown-ups. We're allowed to make our own decisions. Mm. Yeah, and you have to, like gambling. Like booze, like skydiving, they've all Cigarettes. got risks. Yeah, yeah. They've all got risks, and you have to treat them for respect. If you go skydiving and don't bother to do your parachute up, you might be. It'll in kill you. Yeah. If you're going to sit and do coke all night, day after day, and not think to myself, this is not how it's supposed to be used, it's going to make you ill. Mm. It's the same thing. You have to treat it with respect. To that point, though, how do you think it should be used? Um, ideally, the majority of people... I've got a little graph somewhere. Um, the majority of people use it about 30 times a year, maximum. Mm. Yeah? At weekends, they get a gram. Yeah? That's 90% of the people that use coke. That's what the research says. Yeah. It is a recreational drug. The best thing to do with coke is either sit in with a few mates, do a few lines and chat shit, as you say, solve all the world's problems. That's yeah. quite cool. And, and the then, other thing is to go out and party. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's not a drug for sitting down and doing and doing and doing and doing. Mm -hmm. We all know that it stops working after a little while and you're only doing it because you can't think of anything else to do anymore. Yeah, then you get another packet in and yeah, it's and we, five in the morning, that person's still chatting shit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, we, I've had a few five in the mornings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I um, did a line, thought, well, this ain't much. All right, I'll give it a go. And as I say, it took me a while to actually work out what coke was. But what I'd, what I'd worked out is if you're going to get addicted to this drug, you're going to have to be pretty damn determined. Mm. And if you're determined to do something, you'll do anything. So um, I, would, I could tell my entire life story, but we'll be here for weeks. Yeah? 
<laughs> but my first coke deal was in in Rio, and that's in the first book I think that's coming out, Finding Peace. See the plug? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so we'll put um, a little plug just up here as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love the book up in it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, I went out, and again, Dicky Hat had a mate in Rio. It was all sorted. Yeah, it would be fine. Gone, you jack shit. Could come up with a gram, couldn't get up, come up with a kilo. And I ended up scoring. I, I, I fucked Dicky Hat off. I said, go on, fuck off home. You're no good to me. I ain't going home empty. And I picked up a young working lady mm. on Copacabana Beach. And I take her upstairs. First thing, she's pregnant. She's eight months fucking pregnant. <laughs> I hadn't even noticed, yeah. And I'll sit her down on the bed and I'll get my little Portuguese English dictionary and my pen and my paper and I'll write out, if you can find me a, a kilo of cocaine, <laughs> I will give you $1,000. And she goes, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> that was my first score. Yeah. And I brought that back, sold that. Went back. So after your mate saying to you, you need to get on board with this, you decided to go to Rio. Yeah, well. Fly yeah. straight over there, find a source through an eight-month pregnant lady. Yeah, well, no, that wasn't my decision. My decision <laughs> was to happened. go with my mate <laughs> who knew someone who did quite good in South Africa who yeah. didn't. Yeah. Yeah. But my decision was to do it. And um, I sold it in Amsterdam. I never worked the UK. I didn't like working in the UK. They're vindictive bastards. Who? The people in the, the UK? Brits, or? The British plod. Yeah, yeah, the plods. plod. They sent the police to two of my trials, yeah, mm. outside the UK just to fuck me up. Yeah, yeah. Didn't go well, did it, boys? <laughs> um, so um, anyway, they've indexed bastards, so I don't work the UK. I don't like it. Um, Would you say they're the worst police out of what you've dealt with? Ooh, what are you talking about worse? Well, do you, as in vindictive, do you think they are more on job and and less reasoning than other countries that you've dealt I with? I think they've got little Britain-itis. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they suffer with this idea. M most of them, I've, I've brought you some bits and bobs, but like chief commissioners are coming out left, right and centre going... All right, we give up. It doesn't work. Let's mm. legalise this thing and control it. It's out of control. Yeah. Yeah, and the government goes, shut up. We get votes for saying we're going to be hard on drugs. Mm -hmm. And that's where, the, but yeah, they can be a bit arsehole. But then we're like the biggest producers of, of uh, medical cannabis in the UK. Aren't the Americans beating us? Probably now, but we was, you know, well, the fact is that it's it, we produce it in a medical form but don't give it to the public in a legal form. Yeah, but I'll tell you what, if you want some, I can make a phone call now and I can get you some hash. Not hash these days, it's weed here, isn't it? Mm. I can get you some weed quicker than you can get a pizza. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. We both know that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure you can do the same. I'm sure you don't because you're a law abiding citizen. I went, I went to 420 uh, dressed as that weed leaf behind you, and one of the questions I asked was, "What's what's your biggest ick with your dealer?" And everyone went, "He always takes fucking ages." <laughs> <laughs> well, they're obviously he's, buying him weight. Yeah. Aren't they? <laughs> or he said he'll be five minutes, and then he's fucking two hours. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, where was we going with that? <laughs> we were just saying that it's universally mm. available. Mm -mm. Yeah, even the Home Office have turned around and said, the money we spend, which is 19 billion a year, something like that, mm. you can check the facts later, Yeah, yeah. Um, has no noticeable effect on supply. Oh, what the fuck's that? Yeah. Yeah, like they started this whole, whole prohibition gig in 1923, we're celebrating a hundred years of failure this year. Mm. It's a total failure. You can't stop it. So why not control it? If you don't want to take drugs, I'm not suggesting we make them compulsory. If you think other people shouldn't take drugs, all right. Well, why don't we try making it illegal and ban it? But how many hundred years are we going to be doing that? Like, it's had a hundred years ago. It's not working. 
Mm. Let's legalise it. 50 billion pounds a year. That's a lot of money is going into the hands of criminals. Now, some of them are quite likeable. Some of them not so much. <laughs> um, but some of them are quite likeable. But they're all criminals. They don't pay any tax. A lot of them cut shit. Like, it's very hard to buy clean Coke. Yeah, And the stuff they put in it, it's not good for you. Yeah? It's not good for you. I have a girlfriend, ex-girlfriend... She lost her, her hearing in Rio because she was doing coke cut with ground marble. Mm. And it just blocked her passages and they couldn't clean them out. She went deaf. It's not a joke. They've got this fentanyl shit right now. It's killing people. Yeah, that's People are huge. buying coke mm. and they got fentanyl in it. They're not it's opioids it. as well, isn't it? I mean, Chicago yeah. just done. You've got people looking like zombies in a car. Or there's now these videos where it's going along the streets and they're just they're just fucked. Yeah, oh, it's hundreds of them. You know that is a massive problem in America for sure, and one that doesn't get shown on any news form. It's strangely enough, the people on the street are like well, I know it's like anybody else. They're at rock bottom, and they've chosen their their drug of suicide. Yeah, for sure. But the big problem in the states, as far as I can understand it, is all those people that were sold on. What's it? What was it called? Quantamine or something? What was it? What was that? Was it a pharmaceutical one or oil? About oxycontin. Oh right, yeah. Yeah, by the by oxy, this, yeah, yeah, oxycontin. They were sold it. The guy, the guys from the pharmaceutical company, used to go around the doctors and beg, borrow, bribe, and seduce them into into yeah, um, fucking like a salesman, like handing it out. Yeah, mm -hmm. and they were making huge bonuses. And the guy that ran the entire company, who comes from a very famous company, a you know, family who were putting millions into all the, these great causes, when they found him guilty of purposely making addicts of millions of people, mm. they sent him down for four years. I got six for aiding and abetting somebody clean a kilo. Yeah. They sent him down for four years. It's a joke. Mm. It's a joke. Make it legal. Control it. Control the quality. If somebody is abusing a drug, you've got the money to sit him in front of a decent psychologist and say, yeah. what's the problem? Why are you trying to kill yourself? Why do you want to be out of it all the time? Mm. How can we help you? Yeah, Portugal. You've only got to look at what they've done in Portugal. It's an amazing situation, yeah? Deaths are right down, addiction's right down, usage is right down, which is not convenient as far as the salespeople are concerned. Mm. Yeah? It's not problematic. No, no. Legalise control. That's it. Yeah, and then I think, like with Portugal, I mean, there's Denver as well now. Like, you know, the, the thing is as well with pharmaceuticals, um, you know, there's people with doing antidepressants for like 10 years. I saw well, did them for 20 years. Yeah. One they sec. never took him off them. We got, yeah, we got cool. one camera going a bit. Fucking okay. So we're back after a uh, short technical problem. We are two cameras after three, but, you know, I'm I'm a, I'm an independent brand over here from a fucking shed, so if anyone was to support me with a new camera, I need one. <laughs> <laughs> but we are back, and uh, we've been talking, you know, quite a while, and we've, 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 we've said what you've got up to mainly, you know, and what you've got away with mainly, but what is it that you haven't got away with, and where did that end for you right. <laughs> so I've been where did you get in trouble <laughs> I've been incredibly lucky yeah it's just sometimes your luck runs out um when I just started the business when I just started moving a little bit of coke I came back one time and um it hadn't gone as well as I wanted I didn't have quite as much money as I wanted to take back so I had a brilliant idea I bought seven keys of hash from the people that were buying my Coke and put them in the back of my car and brought them back to England. And I pulled in at the docks at about three o'clock in the fucking morning. 
And is that um, not a good time, or was that? Just well, it wasn't good time? for me. <laughs> yeah, I suppose it's a lot more empty then as well. Yeah, there was nobody there. There was me and this lorry driver who bought in six hundred kilos or something. So it was a lovely day. Fucking hell. Anyway, I got pulled, and um, hash. You can't fucking hide hash. I've been getting away with this innocent face and happy attitude for ages. Anyway, they decided to look under my seat. And they found seven kilos of hash. So I busted. They sat me down. They said, right, Simon, you know, tell us where you got it. We can make this easy for you. We know you're not the man, blah, 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 blah. And I, I was quite polite and said, thank you, gentlemen. I have nothing to say until I've spoken to a lawyer. So they go, ah, so you've got a lawyer, have you? <laughs> No, I haven't got a lawyer, but get me the number of release. They'll have one. Ah, oh, so you know a bit about drugs, do you then, Simon? Well, no, but I was a youngster, you know. We know about release. So I phoned up release, and they brought me this guy called Peter down. He was fabulous. Yeah, I sit down with him, and I say, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, right. Well, my advice to you right now, for the moment, is to say nothing at this time. So, customs come back in all smiles, right, you spoke to your lawyer, and I go, yeah, and he's advised me to say nothing at this time. And that was the end of our conversation. And that was it. I stayed on remand for a year because I wanted to clear other things up. We told them I was going to plead guilty, but they still let me stay on remand for a year. What's remand was, again? Remand is where... No, they didn't put me on remand. No, they put me on bail. Sorry, idiot. All oh, right, okay. So you... I was on bail. Remand, remand is when you're in there. I was yeah, on you, bail. Yeah, you were allowed me. out, yeah. It was a horrid year, I tell you, because every week I had to phone my lawyer to see if it was this week I was going into court. Mm. So I didn't have a phone. I was broke. Yeah. So anyway, I turn up in court. Tell them all about my mitigating ex circumstances that I've lost my business, blah, 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 blah. And the judge turns around to me. Now, my lawyer's already told me, you get 18 months to two years is the tariff for this. You're going to get around that. All right. So in the meantime, I borrowed the mate's passport and did a couple of runs to Africa. <laughs> Picked up a, a couple of suitcases of weed so my missus had money while I was away. And... Um, so there I am, in front of the judge, all oh, nice and so the sa the same um, jacket, yeah, the nice blazer, Marks and Spencer's, very nice, very simple, poor. Yeah. So the judge says, "Well, you poor. must understand. You <laughs> must you must understand. You must understand that this sort of crime, you will get a prison sentence." And I'm thinking, "Yeah, eighteen months, maybe two years." He's going on a bit. So, so I sentenced you to eight months, and I thought, fucking hell, what a result. <laughs> and he says, four suspended. And I went, oh, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> My lawyer came down after the event and just said to me, um, you lucky, lucky bastard. Now, those of you who know the, mil the milieu might think I spoke. I swear to God, I've never spoken to a policeman. I don't even ask them the time or where a watch shop is. So mm -hmm. I just got lucky. So they sent me to East Church, to an open prison, where I learnt to paddle a canoe, snorkel, had a great time on a, on a um, sports course, got completely wrecked one time because a mate brought me in about half an ounce of hash on a visit and I swallowed it, yeah? <laughs> And it opened in my stomach halfway through a game of basketball after the visit. I was wrecked for a week, <laughs> completely fucking wrecked, man. I'd wake up in the morning and I'd look at the windows on the hut. It was a Nissan hut, right? And if they had frosted glass moving over them in multicolours, I knew I was still fucking stoned again. Um, so I did, me, I did me three months and a bit, came out. Spent a year rehabilitating myself, uh, and you can read it in the book, but basically I, I helped my mum-in-law sell her house and whatever, and then went back to work. Didn't have a problem again for a while, and then in the third book of the this series, I tell about what happened in, in La Paz. Somebody who owed me money dobbed me in, and we got raided. 
Uh, Where did you get raided? Where were you in then? La Paz, in the office. Oh, right, okay. We, we did knitwear. We made knitwear. I had uh, Vivian Westwood was one of the people that was knitting for it or designing for us. It's mm. quite a nice story. Um, so anyway, we got busted. And was this a front business then, or? Yeah, well, no, it was like I it was a business story. business, but uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but explain why I kept going to Bolivia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So anyway, uh, <clears throat> we get busted. They come in with the dog and the guns, etc. But we already smelt that something was going to happen because the guy we were having a fight with, his dad was a colonel in the drug squad. So we we cleaned the house out totally. And they came in, and uh, while this is happening, one of our guys had gone to Peru to pick up some dye, because we were dyeing the wool to make samples, mm -hmm. which explains <clears throat> the big pump and filter that we used to filter the liquid coke. Yeah, but because we were filtering wool... Uh, we were dyeing it and then putting on the filter and drying it through. We had a reason to have this thing, yeah. So anyway, in they come. We're all busted. And in walks Pablo from Peru with a suitcase full of dyes, powdered dyes. <laughs> and they've gone spare. Like, they've got this suitcase full of different coloured powders. Mm. And we called him the Tinto Traficante. Traficante is... Drug dealer in Tinto means ink. Yeah, or colour, yes. Yeah, it was yeah. the Tinto traffic anti. We got took right up. I thought they were going to kill us. Mm. Seriously, I would, thought they were going to kill us because we all got shoved in. My girlfriend who worked for me, my partner, the maid, Pablo. We all get put in the back of the truck. And the guys in the office had said, bring the cases. And they told us to pack cases. So I've got 15 pairs of underpants and whatever. So we get taken up right up into the mountains to where their office is. I think, well, they're going to throw us off a cliff here or what? But no, you're getting investigated. And um, my girlfriend, I didn't speak enough Spanish, certainly was bright enough not to try and defend myself in Spanish, was translating for me. And the guy says to me, so, why have you got a pump? Why have you got a filter pump? You telling me that you need a filter pump for dyeing wool? And I went, yeah, we were experimenting, you know, getting the colours right, trying new colours. I said, uh, you know, it's a case of experimentation. He said, well, well, this is business life. I said, well, you do know how penicillin was invented. It was an accident. And he went, yeah, I can tell you how penicillin was invented. It comes on the side of the walls in here. Do you want to see it? And Breeza, my girlfriend, gives me a big nudge and says, stop showing him you're intelligent. <laughs> so we get, put, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, got, we get put on house arrest, right? And uh, see, I'm a lucky cunt. Oh, I can't say that word. Lucky fucker, sorry. Um, I'm a lucky fucker because we get put on house arrest, right? Mm. And um, the guys have got their guns, but they're just squaddies, yeah? Across the road from us is a little shop that sells beer. We were wrecked the entire weekend. We kept sending the maid out for another case of beer, and we're all drinking beer. We've had a great weekend. Everything's cool. We know that they've got nothing. So we're cool. So Monday morning comes, and the maid gets up, and it's a him. Yeah. And he gets up and says, right, I'm going to go and get another case of beer. And the new cop goes, no, you're not. And he says, yes, I am. Mm. <laughs> yeah, suddenly it turned. Yeah. Um, well, you shot him? No, no, no. Oh, he no. just made the click, click oh, with the right, gun. Okay, yeah, he yeah. just made his point. I was going to say. Uh, so we were there for a week. And um, after the week, they decided that we weren't. And uh, we gave him a party. <laughs> yeah, we invited him around. We gave him a party at the end of the week. Yeah. And they're all there, and there was one, one guy who was a bit of an arsehole. He wouldn't let us go to the cinema. Mm. Any of the others would have let us go back off to the cinema for the day, but he wouldn't let. So we all sat there, and one of them says to me, 
you know, Simon, we knew you weren't the traffic hunter from the beginning. And I went, oh, really? Yeah. Good. How did you know that then? He said, he didn't have a gun. Mm. Traffic hunters always have guns. I've never handled a gun in my life. You don't have to be a criminal. You don't have to kill people. You don't need a gun. Never had one. So, in that case, we walked away from it. There's more to the story, but mm -hmm. this is a 40-year record. You haven't got 40 years to listen to it. <laughs> so that was the first time. Was that always a choice, a gun? Never, never to use a no, gun? No, never. No. I never. I never used one. I never worked with people that did use one. The series is... Do you ever to get one pulled on you? Yeah, apart only from, by apart cops. Apart from the guy with a maid. <laughs> only by cops. Yeah, yeah. Only yeah. by cops. Um, the series is called To Live Outside the Law. You know the rest of it. It comes from Absolute Sweet Marie, and it's To Live Outside the Law. Hmm. You must be honest. And I was honest. What a criminal. Yeah, what a gangster. I just don't agree with the law on cocaine. Yeah. So if I don't agree with you, I'll take my right to uh, use it to my advantage. Mm. Yeah, if you're going to give me a big bonus for ignoring your law that I think's a shit law, I'd be foolish to refuse, wouldn't I, being polite? Mm. So I smuggled. So the next time was about 10 years later and in Brazil. And that was a little heavier. Mm. That was a little heavier. They put, picked up a delivery of mine coming in with 20 kilos in it. And the guy had dobbed me in. And we had... How was you transporting now then? Cause liquid, liquid. Liquid. But it come, comes in from Bolivia into into Brazil. I was working out of Rio. comes in either in tyres or false flat bottoms mm. or the bottom, the bo bottom of the tank. Yeah, they've got blocks of powder to move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the end, I started having them ship it to me in liquid. I taught them how to do it and shipped it in. But at that time, boom. So they turn up, and I'm just about to bloody retire. It's always the one, isn't it? I'm just, well, when I say I'm about to retire, the plan was... Wasn't that to... every time that you started it for a year? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I am. I just bought a fuck-off house. I've got a trucking company, a discotheque. I've got money coming out my ears. And I'm just doing this last 30 keys. And then I'm going to, to Holland for a year and I'm going to make ecstasy. I've got a guy set up to make ecstasy. So when I say retire, just, I was just, just, just changing, for... cha <laughs> changing countries and, and drugs of choice. Because again, with ecstasy, it's ridiculous. That it's illegal. It needs mm. to be controlled. Quality has to be looked after. Needs to be used sensibly. But it's a ridiculous law. It's all right. They turn up, I'm just going into the house. We've had a big party the night before. I've got four couriers all ready to go. Yeah, I've got my partner there. My wife's there, she, to be wife's there. We've got um, 10 kilos at the house already prepared. There's nothing in this new house that I'm having refurbished. I'm having rebuilt from scratch. Beautiful house it was was owned by a couple of Swiss bank robbers before. That's another story. <laughs> um, so anyway, I'm just walking into the gate because we're going to get a delivery of 20 today and I'm walking into the gate of the house when this taxi pulls out and out comes four armed men. Plod. Mm -hmm. So they come in the house. They tear the house apart. Can't find fuck all. But they found all the all the paperwork on the, the trucks and paperwork on this and paperwork on that. And I think there's 60 grand in the house or something like that. It's not a lot of money. Um, but um, anyway, they sit me down and they go, you know, well, Simon, we're going to have to come to some sort of deal here, Simon. And in the meantime, my missus is sat on 10 keys. And the guy who was supplying us dobs her in mm. and tells him she's got it. Was he there? No, he wasn't with me, but he was with them. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, he phones her up and says, look, Simon's got a problem. Get out with the kit. Unless she walked out the door, they grab it. 
And of course, they don't know what the fuck it is because it's all in bottles of wine. She's walking out with a case of wine. So it takes them an hour or so to work it out, or five minutes probably. And they turn up with a bottle on a tray. And they go, what's this, Simon? And I went, my ball's on the plate. All right, what's the deal? It cost me everything. It cost me about half a million. Mm. At the end of the deal, and it is, it's a business. In South America, it's a business. Yeah? Everybody knows it's bullshit. Everybody knows that there's lots of money involved. The cops, it's a commercial business, yeah? If they're busting you, it's so that their kit can get through or their guys can get, get on all right. So anyway, I've sat down, I've done a deal. I've said, right, you can have this, you can have that, you can have this, you can have that, you can have that, you can have this, you can have that. And they say, yeah, all right. One person has to say. This has made too much noise. Yeah, and People in the office know all about it, blah, blah, blah. Somebody's got to get busted. Who do you want? And I went, well, it's me, isn't it? And they said, no, 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 you misunderstood. Could be anybody. It could be Malta. Yeah, could be Vicky. Vicky was my wife. They didn't like my wife. She gave them shit. Uh, it could be Vicky. And they're going, yeah. And I went, no, 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 no. And I said to the guy, look, excuse me, sir, but you're the head of your team, aren't you? <laughs> so, so when you go in the favela, favela of the slums, yeah, this is where all the big gun battles go. When you go in the favela, you go first, don't you? Because you're the captain, aren't you? And he goes, yeah, like it. He's sat in the fucking armoured car, listening on the phone. I said, well, I'm captain of my ship. I'll go down. And that changed the whole atmosphere. And the guy said, all right, Simon, we'll get you the lawyer. We'll give you all the help you need. We'll do what we can. It's a difficult case, but we'll try and get you out. Mm. And that's what they did. They did. I got the lawyer. He was well, pff, cost a fortune. That's Seth. Um, he um, worked for the big Bicheros. Bichero is the lottery, illegal lottery there. He worked for the big heads of the, the favelas. Uh, real mafia. What do you mean, illegal lottery? Oh, well, the lottery was illegal. I don't know if oh, it's right, still, right so now, it's yeah. illegal. Back in the and day. it's called, called Bichero because they didn't use numbers. They used animals because lots of people were illiterate and didn't know what the numbers are. Oh, right, so okay. Bicho is animal. So you've got chicken, cow, yeah, yeah. that, 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 that. Yeah. So anyway, I get banged up, but I've got to run to the place. I'm paying $300 a week for my suite. Everybody else is locked up in cages, 30 to a cage. Me, I've got the head of the, the uh, cell blocks. It's a holding cell. Cell for people that are dangerous or people that are high profile, yeah? And press on my wire. And I've got my, my suite. So I sleep during the day when the cops are about. Cops go home, I get up, I wander around. And it was... Six months until Fucking it came hell. to trial. And I had a whale of a time. There are two big criminal gangs there. There's the Commando Vermelho and the Primera Commando. And they fight like cat and dogs and I was mates with both of them. Yeah. And we used to have coke come in. We'd give the guards a bit of money. They'd go out and get us a couple of beers, coke. We'd have a night out, have a few joints. It was like a joke. A joke. And one the one the, one couple were, they used to, the girls used to come two at a time. One couple were arseholes. They woke me up one day because I owed them $10. And I told them, like, fuck off. And I wouldn't buy anything whenever they came. I wouldn't do business with them. So they decided to get me. Yeah. So they went to all the cell blocks and went, who doesn't like the green guy? And everybody went, no, he's cool. No, but, who, you know, who doesn't like him? No, he's cool. So they put me in the poorest cell of the lot, which was Commando, uh, Tercero Commando. And we had a fucking party all night. They came down and gave us shit for making too much noise. <laughs> Could you, well, can you speak Spanish or? Yeah, yeah. this is Portuguese. Like, Portuguese, I used to speak yeah. Portuguese like, like a Brazilian, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, one time I, I was haggling over money and the guy said, leave him alone, he even speaks slang. He's one of us. But I've forgotten the Portuguese now. Mm. Um, but yeah, it was all in Portuguese. 
And then I got a knock. Oh, I'm down. And then came my trial. And we produced, done a whole load of work. I had a good lawyer. Vicky had done a marvellous job on backstory. We, the only people, the prosecutor was bought, the lawyers were bought, the police was bought, the judge wasn't. Mm. The judge wasn't. And he got shit after it because everybody said he'd been bought, but he wasn't. So I'm in court waiting to be there. You've got a different system. You get interrogated by the judge on your own, yeah? I'm sitting waiting for this and two guys come in, sit in the wings. And Vicky comes in and says, they're from Scotland Yard. I went, fuck, what are they doing here? All right, okay. So while I'm waiting for the judge, I turn to these two guys and I say, what are you doing here then? Well, you've come to make sure you get a fair trial. And I go, my nice wing, because it's too late, lads, I've already paid not to. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not popular. That's another reason I don't work England if I can avoid it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I got a not guilty. I got a not guilty. And... Uh, you are, you're, you're a lucky guy, I tell you. I am that. a very lucky guy. <laughs> oh, no, I am a very lucky guy. Mm -hmm. I will I will not kid you not. Because you must have seen some shit in them prisons. There must yeah, have been well, some you crazy... See, you see, the one I was in in Brazil was pretty cool. Mm. It, they were still sleeping on the fucking floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but they were in groups and they supported one another and everybody was on the back end. Uh, yeah, the guys used to bring in shit loads of brand new sneakers they got big thing for sneakers gangsters yeah they have to have brand new white white nikes every week mm. so they used to bring this in and the guards used to get sorted and it was it's all right do you always remember your first day of going into one <sighs> first day's always a bit of a blur yeah first day's a bit of a blur and i only remember the good bits because that's otherwise Women would only have, ever have one child. Mm. We're designed <laughs> yeah. to forget the shit. Yeah. yeah? Mm. So <clears throat> to run you through, because I know you got you want to go to bed eventually. <laughs> um, so I got out on that. Went back to work. Everything goes smoothly for a few years. Then came. Um, we used to just to just to because there's a lot, but just to. Like, so was you still running through clothes, wine bottles? You know, is that how you were doing it then when I, you come I back would, out again? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but I moved so what, countries. So you, were you running, like, these businesses? How much, oh, fucking, right. how much fucking dough were you making at this point as well? <laughs> my best year, my best year I made $3 million. Okay. Cool. For me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's after everybody else got paid. Got paid, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's my best year. But you wanted to hear about jails. I'll yeah, take, yeah. I'll take you through. No, no, go on. The last well, couple. There's only digging. Couple. <laughs> no, it's free. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. For 40 years, I had an awful lot more time out. Yeah, this was another six six months and I was out. Yeah, it was no big thing. Mm. But it was hairy. If it had gone wrong, I'd have got 10. Yeah, 15 yeah. 15 maybe, because I was in all the newspapers. Cleverest traffic in in... Rio, Bright, the Englishman, Simon McCoy, back in this, back in that, back in the other, TV, yeah. everything. Was something they would want to make a... It was interesting, mm, yeah, because it was different. A lot of eyes what, on it. Wine wasn't known, it wasn't known, and um, it was in the early years, and it was interesting. Mm. So, Paraguay, we got nicked at the airport. I won't bore you with the whole story, but it ends up there again. I'm 30 keys again. There's two girls in um, Argentina because they got through. One guy got all the way through, and there's a guy with me. And he gets nicked. And I did nine months there, and I could not find a way out. It was really, really hard. Like, it's as corrupt as fuck. Mm. But every time I started to make a move, the British Embassy would give would give the Paraguayans new boats and new computers for their drug squad. Yeah. They were like, it was a game. They didn't want me to walk out. And in the end, I got to go and see the judge. Same thing, yeah, we get interviewed. But before I get there... A guy comes from Peru, from the head of drugs office there, which is the, what's he called? Intelligence. And he's come down. 
He went and spoke to the newspapers and told them that I was known English mafia. And he sat down and showed my judge stuff from everything else they had, all the intelligence they had, that like I weren't going to get a not guilty under any circumstances. And you can't do that in the UK. Mm. Yeah, the cops can't do that in the UK. That's like dirty. Yeah, it's a game. Everybody knows it's a game and they cheated. So I cheated too. Um, I used to support the old people before I became one. <laughs> and they had their own wing and they used to buy eggs and flour for stuff and they used to go and support them and at the time I was a practising Catholic so I used to go to uh, the Catholic meetings we used to have Bible class once a week and I'd go to that and um, the priest there would tell anybody everybody has the right to escape from prison yeah, he didn't have a problem with it at all. So anyway, one of the guys stands up and says, look, I, I won't be coming to the meeting next week. Um, I'm going out. My lawyer's sorted me out. I'm going out. And I went, oh, yeah. He said, yes, yeah, she wants to talk to you. And I went, OK, well, look, I'll tell you what. Tell her to come and see me next week if you're out. And yeah. She did. She was gorgeous. She was really tall, very beautiful. She'd seen me about three times before, and every time she got... She named up. after a fucking flower and all. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember her name. I will do by the time it gets... Saving written. Grace. <laughs> I'll ask me missus. She'll remember, because she wasn't fond. <laughs> um, she was really tall. And she, the system was quite simple. Um, I wouldn't give anybody any money up front, because they can all get you out. They can all get you out. They are all cousins, play football, best friends, brother-in-law of the judge. And you've only got to give them 50 grand or 20 grand or five grand, depending on how uh, low you down, are down on your money, mm. and they'll get you out. But of course, they just take the money and fuck off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I always say, yeah, fine. I'll put the money in escrow. The minute I'm out the door, you got the money. Oh, no, but we got expensive, mama. Anyway, so this one, I break the rule. And it was a very straightforward system. We pay the Palace of Justice to change on their um, computer the uh, crime that I'm accused of. They pay another judge to find me not guilty of that crime. And they put under the table the crime I'm in for. So I got found not guilty of being caught at the airport with false money. Right. And they came and got me out just after Christmas, 28th of December. And I'm stood there, and it's going like that. If you can't see it, it's going like that, yeah? Because fuck, all these guys in the, the yard, we're, doing, oh, sorry, we're, we're coming out the yard, yeah? It's five o'clock. And they're going, fucking 30 kids at the airport, and he's getting a not guilty. And only one of them's got to make a phone call mm -hmm. to the press, and it'll go, shit, sir, tits up. So we then go through, oh, hell, oh, hell. Yeah. First of all, I got three of us out because I had a mate and I thought, fuck it, at this price, I'll get another one. So I got a mate out as well. So three of us went there. Yeah. yeah. And the mate was a Muslim and uh, he was a sad lad. He'd got caught at the airport with four keys working for family and nobody was helping him. Mm. And I had a little factory because you might have got the idea, I like working. So I had a little factory and we made leather goods inside there and he worked for me there and I went, go on, come as well. So they come and they say, look, your lawyer's here. Yeah, live with that, coming out. I'll come pick you up in a couple of hours. So all the other prisoners go into their, their blocks and I'm still on the yard waiting. And I've told this guy, go and get your gear, we're going. And I've told Bon Brill, who was my courier, called Bombril because of his hair. Bombril is um, he's, uh, like a Brillo pad. Right. Yeah, and his hair was like a Brillo pad, so he was called Bombril. Tell Bombril, Bombril's like there in a the minute. Yeah. I'm there in a the minute. This guy, 20 minutes later, he's still not there. He turns up, he's perfumed, he's perfectly dressed, he's got his little bag. Come, sorry. What a failure. So, we then get put through and we get photographed, fingerprinted, mm. 
in a few years, and the head of the, the police in the prison was also in on it, obviously. The head of the head of security of the prison wasn't, and he got put in jail. So anyway, head of the prison's there, the, uh, the police, and he goes to me, yeah, Simon, you got a present for me? And I went, I think you'll find my, my lawyer's already given you your present. And he went, yeah, all right. <laughs> so I'm first one released. Yeah, yeah. But I'm now in a corridor between the jail and the front gate. And I'm still waiting for something to go wrong while the other two are being processed. Because that door's quite slow, isn't it? <laughs> oh, it's a very big door when yeah. you want to enter. Yeah. It's tiny when you try and get it. Yeah, yeah. So it's going like this. And I'm talking to the guards and saying, can I come back on Saturday visiting day because I've left my TV? And they're going, yeah, you can. I told you I'd come out the front door, didn't I? I told you I was innocent. So can I go and wait outside for these two? And they went, no, you just wait in here. I crossed the river into Argentina the same night. Yeah, we went in the little rowboat. boat. It's on the frontier between Argentina and I rowed across in there. Yeah. <laughs> there are other stories. If I give it all the way, there's no point in reading the book. No, no, so, no. Right. So where did, where did Buddhism come in? Right, well, okay, so... So I'm just now everyone working. knows you've got to go and read the fucking book because that's <laughs> there's enough stories there's, there. There's, this is some a lot of this is not in the books that are available there are other good stories in them mm -hmm. um but in the meantime right so i'm now working out of argentina yeah i've been in england i've took my son when he was 16. we went he was a very bright he is a very bright lad um and he worked out the english school year ends in june and the australian School year starts in February, and I was going to Australia occasionally. And he went, well, can I go and do my A-levels in Australia, which is called a matriculation? And I went, yeah, he loves cricket. Yeah, why not? Why not? And he got six months off, so we went around the world in six months. Oh, great. That sort of yeah. World Cup cricket. We went here, we went there, we went everywhere. And in India, I went up to um i was looking at the indian market it pays the same as uk prices so it's quite a good place to work but it didn't come to anything we didn't get a connection that i really liked um but in the meantime we went up to dharamsala which is where the dalai lama comes from and i've always had an interest in buddhism from a kid I used to read a book called zen flesh Zen bones which are a lot of um little puzzles now, there's a proper word for it. I've come up with it in five minutes. <laughs> um, so, it will come up to you. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I, we end up at Dharamsala and I walk around the temple pushing these huge prayer wheels saying, may I study Buddhism? May I study Buddhism? And I did the wrong thing because if I had just known a little bit more, I'd have said, may I realise Buddhism? Because studying it is one thing, but actually getting it is something entirely else. Mm. But in the meantime, in this temple, just as a little aside, nice little thing, um, my son comes from a little place in Lincolnshire where there is one Indian, he runs the Indian restaurant. There is one Chinaman, he runs the Chinese restaurant. And everybody else is white as snow. Uh, so here we are in India. And then he comes over to me and he says, here, yeah, Dad, he's 16, yeah. Here, yeah, Dad, those boys over there keep looking at me. And I said, yeah, go and say hello to him. No, nah, they keep looking at me. Go over and say hello. They just haven't seen a white man before. Go and say hello. About half hour later, he comes back and says, you were right. They've never seen a white boy. They love cricket. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway... How old were you then? Oh, God. Um, right. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you asked me that. I he, if he was 16. Out. If he was 16, yeah, I'm trying to work it out from a basis without saying it out loud because <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't want to yeah, yeah. finger the boy. Uh, so that would have been at, um, yeah, which would have made me 50. 56, something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 50, no. 
No, it would have made me about 52. About 52. About 52. So anyway, um, I decide what I'm going to do. Just get this kit sorted, this last one done. You know the last one. Then I'm going to retire, come back here and swap English lessons for Dharma lessons, mm. learn about Buddhism. So, of course, all goes tits up, everything goes wrong. I end up back in the UK. I start learning to med meditate in Boston. <laughs> so, anyway, but I'm starting. It's all cool. And one day I go on a retreat, how to meditate in a centre in Derbyshire. And as I turn up, my teacher from Boston turns up the same minute. And she said to me, what are you doing here? And I said, oh, I'll come for this. And she said, no, I don't go to the, that one. Go to this one. We're all going to this one. And it was a teacher's advice from the heart. And it was amazing. It was amazing. It's all about a guy called Atisha who brought Buddhism to Tibet. And they actually paid him to come with a man's weight in gold. He was that precious. And he is giving his leaving speech. He doesn't actually leave, but he gives a leaving speech. And it's about 35 pieces of good advice. And it's called a teacher's advice from the heart. You can get it online. You don't have to pay for it. It's a brilliant piece of advice. And I'm sitting and they're, they're going through one by one. And as they do, there's a little bell in my ear going, I knew that. Yeah, I knew that. Yeah, well, of course. And as I'm going through, I'm thinking, I've done this before. And um, my original plan was to learn to meditate so I could smuggle better because I'd have a clear mind. <laughs> yeah. But things changed. Um, and then I ended up in Argentina and I supported the centre there because I could. And um, I got quite into it. And then I retired again. And I was in Oz. And uh, my mind rang me up and said, look, I've got a problem. Now, the reason I've retired is we just landed $8 million worth of kit in Turkey. And it was his job to turn that into money. Mm. And I was sweet. And um, in the meantime, this guy comes out and says, look, I've got some mates, they've got some dirty Charlie. He's come out, and this time, by this time, everybody's thin to doing it in liquid. Everybody's doing it impregnated in clothes. Everybody's doing it. It's no longer new. Yeah, this yeah. Is, this is 30-odd years later. Um, and I said, right, I can't help him because the guy owes me $8 million. You're not going to say fuck off, are you? No, no. So I go in, and it's they. In order to avoid the smell, they put a chemical in, and it's coming out brown. Well, nobody wants to do too that looks like shit. Yeah. So I've taken it back to base, and uh, I've taken it back to base, and I need to filter the base out of the liquid, and I need a pump to do that to do it properly. So I go buy one. And either the guy in the shop dobbed me in or my mate dobbed me in. I mm. don't know which one it was, but I never saw a cent of that eight million. Um, and I got busted. And I was, you can't buy your way out, or not with the money I had, because it didn't get me eight million. Um, so I'm banged up. And there is a group called The Liberation Project which are Mahayana Buddhists from Tibet. And they help people in jail. And they teach meditation. And I went on a four-year retreat. I just spent my time meditating and practicing Dharma. Mm. And um, I used to say to, because I, I worked, I was the librarian at one point. I was the clerk at the... Uh, the building site, they had a building site where they made schools out of containers and whatever, I was clerk there. Always got a job because I like to work, yeah, I'd rather work than sit around. 
Um, and I used to go to my bosses and say, look, I'm doing a retreat for a long weekend. It's all right if I don't come in till Tuesday. Yeah, no, it's all right. And people used to come into my cell and I had obviously images of the Buddha and books and things I made, little offering things and whatever. People would come into my cell and they'd take their hat off like they were coming into church. <laughs> but it was brilliant. It was brilliant and it was really good for my practice. And I practiced things like when you get an enemy, love them. Mm. When you get somebody who is giving you grief, be kind to them. And I practice it. And I got this job as the clerk in, in this, one of the worst jails in New South Wales, because they didn't like me, because I wasn't, I wasn't compliant, but in a way that wasn't mm. chargeable. Was this yeah. the screws? The screws, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, the screws didn't like me, so they sent me to the hard jails. Um, so anyway, where was I? Whoops. So yeah, people used to come. come. Yeah, you used to come in. Uh, yeah. Think um, you were, think you were the, uh, the, the Lord of the manor. <laughs> yeah. And I used to cook for people. Take your oh, yeah. shoes off. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and I used to cook for people as well, which was cool because I like cooking. So yeah, I used yeah. to get a queue outside my, my cell sometimes when we cooked because that's another story. Yeah. In the, in the meantime... So, there, when I got the job as the clerk, I walked straight into the jail and I got the best job in the jail, like that wallop. And the guys that were working in the same storeroom were not thrilled because mm. they thought they'd got it and they got a little scam and they were smuggling stuff in. And I didn't do any of that shit in jail, nothing. Nothing. I'd stopped doing drugs at that time because mm. of practising Buddhism. Did you ever get approached by other cell members to try and trick you into doing it for them and then oh no they didn't like try to trick me they threatened me yeah 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 <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah and um i, I particularly upset one poor arsehole uh but um yeah i just said no mm -hmm. just said no i don't do that sorry mate yeah. yeah um but anyway so they really gave me shit and i really gave them love and I really did. Like, I'd make special dishes and go, here, yeah, have some of that. It goes really nice for this. And I'm doing it. <laughs> they must have thought you were fucking nuts. Well, I'll tell you what happened. I don't and get it. We this... keep being horrible to him and he keeps making us stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing, the interesting thing is it proves that Dharma works. It's true, though. Because after about three, <clears throat> four months of this happening, I overheard one of the guys that hated me to hell saying, oh, Simon, one of the best geezers in this show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it works. Yeah. But it's like all of Buddhism, what it does is it says, stop, stop. You think you know what it is. Stop. Think. Calmly and logically. Now look at it. When you look at it, it's never what you thought it was. Mm. Nothing is ever what you thought it was. I'm going to briefly touch on this and then move off. But at the at the very heart of Buddhism is a thing called emptiness. This does not mean nothingness. It means that everything is merely a name. Nothing is real. Everything comes from your mind and everything is a prejudice and an idea that you've put on it. But it isn't like that. And when it comes down to it, everything is merely empty. And once you intellectually realise that, first of all, that's very interesting. But if you ever get to realise that, even briefly, it's mind-blowing. And on my last retreat in jail, I was meditating on death and the stages of death. And I'd been meditating solidly for about three hours because there was supposed to be six half-hour meditations. Oh, well, fuck it, I'll do it all at once. Mm. And at that point, either a wind came through the cell door a thought went through my brain 
or somebody said. It is not this. Your mind is much bigger than this. And as it did, everything my teachers had told me made sense. And I had 360 degree vision of emptiness. And I was empty. And do you know what happened? I went, oh, fuck, I'm supposed to be meditating on a flame. I'm not supposed to be doing this. <laughs> I got frightened. Yeah. It yeah. was so big. Mm -hmm. It was so big. And I told some guys a couple of days later, and they were druggies and whatever, and they all went, wow. Yeah, that's what we've been, that's what we do do heroin for that's what we're looking for mm -hmm. yeah and it is like that but then that's it and um i've been practicing dharma for more than 12 years now sometimes i do it well sometimes i do it badly um but i tell you what it's the doing though it's the practicing that counts mm -hmm. and um Tell you what, I couldn't have done four years in an Aussie jail without it. Nah, that got you through it. That got me through it, and that made it a positive experience. Instead of being, a lot of people come out mm. bitter and angry and whatever, and I came out smiling. Yeah, Thank yeah. you very much, lads. See you later. Bye-bye. <laughs> it's funny that you were with your son before, and you had that kind of, you know, first sort of initiation to it, or first sort of saw it. And then you went into prison after it and then found it again. Yeah, um, I was practicing. We have a, in, in the tradition I have, there is a teaching, because I was smuggling, yeah? And we have a tradition, in, or a thing in our tradition, which is right living. And smuggling is not right living, yeah? But the teaching says, if you haven't got the right living, you don't have to give everything up yeah. and change. But you have to change when you can. You have to work towards changing. And I was working towards changing. Eight million dollars would have helped. <laughs> um, so another little aside, my teacher who was a Buddha, he's a Buddha. You know, we're taught to believe that our teachers are Buddha, but this guy was amazing. You know, he was amazing. And he had no idea what I did, because nobody did. Like I said, the bullseye. Outside that bullseye, my girlfriend didn't know what I did, man. Yeah, and I live with her. Mm. Nobody knows what you do. Well, you can't do this job and have people know because people love to talk about things. Yeah. So anyway, one day we were out having ice creams by the river and he looked at me and he went, you know, Simon, you think what you do is very clever, but it's not. It's just a little bit sordid. Mm. And that was it. Yeah. And when I got busted, he sent a big book of, box of books to me straight away. He wasn't bothered at all. Boom, wallop, yeah. Help this man out, yeah. So, and um, before I came here this morning, I made offerings. I offered water for drinking, water for bathing, flowers, incense, lights, perfume, food, which are little bowls of clear water, and music is empty mm -hmm. and I did a meditation and then I did a practice which is the 21 Taras I'm a big fan of Tara she is a uh, compassion Buddha she's a Buddha of compassion and then I came out and I find if I do that I have a good day Yeah, doesn't mean everything goes right but it does mean that when things go wrong, you go. You can deal yeah. with it. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think it is. You know, you ha I, I ran eight k this morning. You know, that's a form of meditation for me. Then I did an ice bath, and then I did uh, about twenty minutes of meditation. You know, but running for me sometimes that's it's, I yeah. stretch first. I always stretch. Yeah. I do the same stretches. Do thirty squats. I do more stretching with my body. Then I do nunchucks a little bit, and mm. then I run. Well, after I've run, all that fucking bullshit I was thinking about in the morning is gone. Yeah. You know, I've, pro I've probably thought about all of it while I was running at the same time. And then I listened to, like, 
philosopher drum and bass while I'm running. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, it's yeah. like I'm getting, you know, getting more it's information. Shutting up that noise in your head. Yeah. That won't go away. That internal dialogue. Mm. I know this will do. Oh, that's going to go wrong. Oh. Yeah, yeah, If you yeah. can shut that out. Yeah, you've got to calm it down. Yeah. You know, just be in the moment. Yeah. There's one final question I ask everyone. Yeah, no, I can't pay. <laughs> 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 so it's... Uh, it's basically, what is reality to you? Sorry, emptiness. Reality, our reality is we live in a place called samsara. But we don't live in a place, it's worse than that. We actually create it. It comes from our head. Hmm. Everything we see and everything we believe is in there. You've done us in, you know... You know when you do acid, you get this thing where where you go, uh -huh. oh, yeah, I got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's it. Yeah. That's it. I mean, it goes and you life. forget what the fuck it was. Yeah, but, yeah. But with Dharma, mm. that is emptiness. That is that is where it comes from. Talking of acid, um, I did a trip up in Lake Titicaca. Yeah. With a mate of mine, well, with two mates, one of the guy who dobbed us in as well. We went up and we did a, a, a cactus called San Pedro. And it's a five star cactus and it grows like 10 feet tall. Mm. And you have to take from the tip of your finger oh, to the microphone, from the tip of your finger to your elbow. Yeah. So you, so, you strip it back, you say? And then you strip out the thick white, uh, thick green skin. Mm. And then there's a light green skin which looks a bit like cucumber. And then behind that is white pith. And that white pith makes you bloody fart. Mm. So you've just got to get the right stuff. So we strip this up. Yeah. And it makes you vomit. It does make you vomit. Yeah. Yeah. But obviously you keep it down as long mm -hmm. as you possibly can. So anyway, we've done this. And in the evening, because it's supposed to be an eight-hour trip, yeah, and we got there at dawn. Uh, in the evening, my dad's coming in from Europe to La Paz, right? So anyway, we do this stuff. And about an hour later, I heave my guts up. And I'm wandering around in a happy, happy buzz. And all these beautiful Aymara women are walking around and they're spinning wool. Spinning alpaca wool, they've got a little spin and they twist it and they bump, and it's beautiful. And they're all staring at me, mm. and it's obviously because you know they can tell that I'm a spiritual being and whatever. That and the fact that my flies are fucking wired, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it took me an hour or so to work this out. Um, and um, I communed with the Incas who have become stones. Yeah, they, they've disappeared, but all they've done is they're hiding in the stones and waiting for it to be okay to come out. Yeah. And then we finally get back to the hotel and I get a phone call. This is customs or immigration at the Paz Airport. We have a Mr. McCoy who wants to speak to you. It's my dad. <laughs> yeah, dad, look, I can't come and pick you up. I really can't come and pick you up, mate. Just get a cab. I'll pay him when they get <laughs> Great way to come and see your son. Then yeah, he really yeah, wrecked yeah. out his box. So there you uh, go. Amazing. That's a bit of a life story. There are 24 books. I did this for 40 years. Did other things. Um, I was on TV a lot at one time. I'll tell you about that another time. Uh, for good things. Yeah, Not yeah. with a bag over my head. <laughs> put my jumper over me. Yeah. Um, I've had an interesting life. I love my daughter. I love my son. They're very valuable. Dharma is very valuable. My books are a gift to all those friends of mine who are either dead or disappeared or host held hostage by the law of the forces of law and disorder. It's a gift to them. Somebody has to tell the truth. Mm. Somebody has to tell the truth. I'm telling the truth. I don't lie. It's part of my uh, my philosophy. I don't lie. I might say it happened in July when it happened in September, and I might <laughs> say it was three when it was 15, 15 when it was Bending three. Bending the truth a little. Yeah. yeah. And um, 
if Mr. Plod is thinking of coming down, and I'm just going to tell him the nah, story, made it up, mate. Yeah. Prove it. Yeah. So there you go. What's your star sign? Cancer. Cancer. Oh, it's your season now. <laughs> got, yeah. Got to feel everything. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's my birthday fairly soon. I want to go home for my birthday. Yeah. Possibly not. We'll chat about that. Well, thanks for sharing your amazing life story. Mm. And, uh, you know, everyone go out and get the book and, you know, follow for the rest of the seasons. You've got a lot of writing to fucking do, haven't you? <laughs> I, can do, I can do three a year. I got cancer last year. Yeah. Uh, and it screwed my system. But um, that's all clear. You're on turkey tail mushrooms? No. Get on turkey tail mushrooms. Yeah. Cured cancer. Yeah. yeah. And Dr. Sebi as well. I'll give you some information all right, about well, this. We'll, we'll, look, we'll you, go on, you've been, you've been with us, but we're off, we're <laughs> off for a cup of coffee in the chat. Yeah. It's been really, excuse me, I'm going to move this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go I'm on. just going to leave it. It's really nice for me. <laughs> you do, mate. Yeah. What <laughs> we got it. between us, 40 years or <laughs> yeah, whatever, exactly. but I tell you, we've been on the same path. No, it's, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for coming to the shed and thanks for listening. And yeah, this one, we're going to be we're gonna be in September when this is out. So yeah, and your new book's going to be out. Book's coming out, it's called Finding Peace. Strangely enough, oh sorry, You're right. books coming out. It's called Finding Peace. Strangely enough, the only other book that gets up in Google called Finding Peace is about Dharma. Yeah. Now isn't that weird? <laughs> it's called Finding Peace because it's the Paz, which means the peace, and it's when when I first went there, and it tells about my first real go at putting it in a way that they can't find you. Are you going to do Audible? Audible's out. I think you should speak them. Yeah, I can't speak them. <laughs> I, I tried, Yeah, but I got a Tom Fairfoot read them. Mm. He's brilliant. He's good. Um, I wanted Billy Bragg to do it, but he wouldn't do it for the money I was offering. <laughs> 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 well, the coffee, actually. Uh, <laughs> but, um, he does a brilliant job. Uh, Finding My Mojo is out on uh, Audible now. Yeah, yeah. And uh, in Amazon September, Kindle, Kindle and everything like yeah, that. Well, yeah, it's on Kindle. That's all it is at the moment, but I'm going to try. I, oh, can we just show the book? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me get it. In the book. Oh, it's yeah, <laughs> it's I'll been, find it. It's sat on there. Um, it's not, well, I'll wait till he comes back. Yeah. We're going to cut loads of this out. It's all right. You're not going to be here for 15 hours. Yeah. So, this is a proof copy. Yeah. There's two of them on the planet. Yeah. Yeah, my mate who comes from NFT Works, who gives me all my, my support, technical support, has got one. And my daughter's got this, but I'm holding it. And as you can see, it's dedicated to her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amazing. And there you go. There's the bottle, there's the powder, there's the lines, there's Mount Illimani. Yeah. And that's the that's the reward, yeah? yeah. Money is applause. Mm -hmm. Money is applause. That's the sincerest form of applause. Mm. If you go chasing the money, it's like chasing a woman, you'll never catch her. Yeah. She comes as a consequence of doing the right things. <laughs> and so does me. Oh, you're speaking to me there. <laughs> Amazing, bro. Right. All right. You enjoy that? See you later, guys. <laughs> nice, to, nice to meet you. Please buy my book. Please buy my book. <laughs> they will. They will. Please. Have fun. See you.